Good morning. The first item of business today is general questions, and we'll start with question number one from Bill Bowman. Hey, thank you, Standing Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how much will arise in Barnet consequentials from the reduction in business rates that was announced in the UK budget and whether it will allocate all of this support to Scotland's retail sector. Cabinet Secretary Derek Mackay. We received £42.9 million consequentials from the UK retail discount scheme. This is in the context, of course, of the real terms cut to Scotland's resource block grant of £2 billion since 2010. As the Member will be aware, Barnet consequentials accrue to the Scottish Ministers and decisions on the full package of non-domestic rates measures for 2019-20 will be made as part of our Scottish budget process. We have a competitive non-domestic rates package and do not uh, actively hypothecate Barnet consequentials other than health. Bill Bowman. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. As reported in the press this week, according to the Scottish Retail Consortium, 11.1% of Scotland's shop units were vacant last month compared to the UK rate of 9.6%. In October, footfall plummeted by 7.5% 7 on high streets. While the UK plans to give 900 million towards business rates relief, cutting a third of expenses for small retailers, the SNP has doubled the large business supplement, costing businesses hundreds of millions of pounds. With Scottish resale facing real difficulty, why can't the Scottish Government commit now to having the, having the large business supplement and matching the UK's rate support for retail and give some good news for firms in Dundee's High Street, Reform Street and elsewhere? Cabinet Secretary. Well, of course, the UK government's working wonders in the British economy right now, isn't it? No wonder the UK's got <laughs> the lowest forecast GDP performance of any EU nation at the moment. So I'll take no lectures from the Tories on how to run uh, an economy, any part uh, of uh, the economy. It's really interesting that Bill Bowman mentions Dundee High Street. Of course, Dundee High Street, like most other high streets, would have benefited from the small business bonus that has protected so many of our retail properties across the country, opposed by the Conservatives and your failure to support our successive budgets, which have ensured that Scotland has the most competitive package of business rates anywhere in the United Kingdom. And I will keep that reputation as we go towards the Scottish budget. But if I replicated all the decisions that the Tories make in terms of Barnet consequentials, that means replicating the cuts as well. And this party, this government makes different choices on our public services. So we'll make the right decisions by the people of Scotland and support our economy in a far more credible way. Maureen Wood. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can the government set out how many recipients there are on the Small Business Bonus Scheme in 2018-19 and how much is being provided in relief over this period? And how does this measure up to the SNP's manifesto commitment to lift 100,000 properties out of business rates altogether? Cabinet Secretary. I'll take great pleasure in updating the Chamber uh, on those uh, numbers. The Small Business Bonus Scheme has provided a record £254 million pounds in relief to 119,400 properties in 2018-19. Therefore, we have met our manifesto commitment, lifting uh, 104,500 recipients out of business rates altogether. James Kelly. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Support for the retail sector will not be helped by the fact that there are 470,000 people in Scotland not being paid the living wage. That's an unacceptably high figure and means a large portion of these people uh, do not have the money to, in order to, to, to spend and support these shops. Will the Cabinet Secretary support uh, Labour's plan for a £10 an hour living wage? And what consideration will the Cabinet Secretary give in his draft budget to address the unacceptably high number of people who have not been paid the living wage? Cabinet Secretary. Well, first of all, it would just be better if uh, real devolutionists ensure that the power to set the living wage rested with this parliament rather than in Westminster. But yes, I am looking at the decisions that we can take around the living wage. Of course, it's uh, the Living Wage Foundation that sets the rate that we've pledged to follow. We'll continue to do that. Uh, I'm looking at those other matters and I'm looking at retail and specific sectors as well, recognising that some sectors uh, have more challenges uh, than others uh, in the delivery of, of the principle. But when it comes to uh, fair work agenda. I think this government has delivered more than any other uh, in the UK and any more than uh, any previous administration has done in taking forward uh, the living wage and fair work agenda. Question number two, Linda Fabiani. 
Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to reduce the inequalities faced by autistic people and people with a learning disability. Minister Clare Hockey. Thank you, President Officer. We are committed to transforming the lives of autistic people and people with learning disabilities. We've listened to their aspirations and needs and want to address the inequalities they face throughout their lives. Our programme for government sets out our priorities and we want autistic people and people with learning disabilities to have the same freedoms and opportunities as other citizens of Scotland. Next month, we will launch the Refresh the Keys to Life implementation framework and it recognises that people with learning disabilities have the same aspirations and expectations as any other person. Linda Fabiani. Uh, thank the, the Minister for her answer. And can she assure me that discussions are being held right across portfolios in government, in education, health, employability, social security and other departments, so that the holistic approach can be used to make sure that people with autism and learning disabilities are given uh, good life opportunities and improving their independence. Minister. As the member has highlighted, autistic people and people with learning disabilities need holistic support right across health, social care, employability, education, criminal justice, social security and social connectedness. In refreshing both the autism and the learning disability strategies, wide engagement has taken place across relevant Scottish Government portfolios. Examples are the cross-policy links with employability and equality colleagues, which led to a commitment to half the disability employment gap. And another was the engagement with social security colleagues, which led to the inclusion of autistic people in designing the new social security system. Thank you. Question number three, Gail Ross. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on its involvement with the Highland Council regarding the Stromferry bypass in Wester Ross. Minister Paul Wheelhouse. The A890 at Strom Ferry is a local road and is the responsibility of Highland Council. Uh, Transport Scotland have provided technical advice to council officials and their consultants on the transport appraisal process since 2013 and I can confirm they are in receipt of the final appraisal report. The report reflects the substantial amount of work undertaken as part of the appraisal process and response will be provided in the near future. As Roads Authority for the A90 at Strom Ferry, final responsibility for a decision to upgrade or improve the route ultimately lies with the Highland Council. Gail Ross. I thank the Minister for that answer. Given that the report into the condition of the rock face is now in the public domain, will the Scottish Government agree to work on a sustainable, economically viable solution to this lifeline route with the Highland Council and Network Rail? Minister. Sir, I, I recognise the importance of this route uh, to communities across uh, Ms Ross's uh, constituency. The Highland Council have just recently provided uh, Michael Matheson, as I say, the, the Cabinet Secretary for Transport, Infrastructure and Connectivity with a copy of the report prepared by the consultants ACOM. Uh, officials at Transport Scotland are currently reviewing this, uh, along with the transport appraisal prepared by the Council, which includes the options that have been identified therein, and they'll continue to provide technical assistance as necessary to identify the correct solutions. Uh, they have also worked very closely with the Highland Council and uh, Network Rail to identify uh, a temporary solution in terms of the uh, crossing or the railway. But as Roads Authority for the 890 at Strom Ferry, the final responsibility for a decision to upgrade or improve the route, as I said earlier in my previous answer, ultimately lies with the Council. But I give a commitment to, to Gil Ross that we'll continue to work closely with the Council. And Edward Mountain. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In the past, blasting has been used to remove the overhanging rocks at Strome Ferry. This has weakened four specific areas. A permanent solution to this will cost five million. Will the Minister offer to help the Highland Council fund the five million to sort out the four overhangs until Transport Scotland can respond to the report that was submitted over a year ago? Minister. Um, I, I can't give any commitments on funding today, as uh, the member will appreciate the, the Cabinet Secretary is not here, uh, but I will certainly relay his, his question to him. We certainly recognise the, uh, the importance of trying to provide as much relief to uh, local users of the infrastructure in the meantime while a longer term solution is provided. Certainly, as I said to, to Gail Ross, we're committed to providing as much technical support to the Council and indeed Network Rail to identify a solution, but I appreciate um, discussions around funding will, will have to take place, but um, that, that is a matter for the Cabinet Secretary. Question number four, Shona Robinson. To ask the Scottish Government what progress has been made since the establishment of the Action Group for the Mitchell Implant in Dundee. 
Cabinet Secretary Derek Mackay. On Monday, I convened the first meeting of the Action Group where the members agreed to purpose, remit and actions. We will pursue all possibilities for retaining and or repurposing the plant as a matter of urgency and are actively working with pace and vigour on our proposition. I have again pressed the UK Government to bring what it can to the table, including seeking additional resource via city deals or indeed industrial strategy resources, and I will keep members advised accordingly. Shona Robertson. Uh, can the Cabinet Secretary uh, confirm that the options will include uh, looking at uh, more than one option to put to Michelin, um, including retention and repurposing? And can the, the Cabinet Secretary outline what commitments were made by the UK Government at the Action Group meeting, including any additional resources that could be made available either through the Tay Cities deal or other funding sources? And how that sits with the comments made to the media after after the meeting by the Secretary of State for Scotland. Uh, can he uh, shed any light on that? Cabinet Secretary. I think Shona Robson asked a, a really important question around uh, the range of options. I've been clear uh, at the Action Group and uh, with members that the company Michelin don't wish to revisit their decision but are interested in the proposition that we'll put to them in approximately two weeks' time. And so we are looking at a range of options to put forward based on the best intelligence that we have. In relation to the contribution of the UK Government, uh, we're relying on the UK Government to help us co-produce that proposition with the intelligence and the support that they can bring to bear. And of course, I have made uh, requests around additional resources as well, uh, with the clarity that we have on the Tay Cities uh, deal, industrial strategy and sector deals. I can neither confirm nor clarify the remarks of the current Secretary of State because at the action group meeting and in the private meetings I've had, I was given assurances that the UK government will assist us to co-produce that proposition and would look at funding streams so to do. I also got that agreement from Greg Clark, the UK government's uh, business uh, secretary. And my next call after First Minister's questions is with another UK government minister in relation to the industrial strategy. So I can't square what the UK government has said to me in terms of bringing support for Michelin with what the Secretary of State said to the courier, the courier on the day of the action group. I hope that the support is forthcoming and that's what I'm working on so that we can genuinely work in partnership to put the best possible proposition, uh, proposition to Michelin so that we can secure an ongoing presence by the company at the site. And I think on that, we should be all absolutely united. Dean Lockhart. Uh, thank you, President Officer. According to media reports, the Scottish Government has invested £8 million in the Michelin plant. Can the Cabinet Secretary confirm the status of this investment and can he confirm that this investment will be used as leverage to secure as many jobs as possible at the plant? Cabinet Secretary. <laughs> what a disappointing response from the Conservatives, I have to say, in terms of our collective efforts. The leverage we have with Michelin right now is they're genuinely interested in our industrial proposition for this country the work in research and development, the skills that we have, the, the legacy, the, the workforce that we have uh, in Dundee and the goodwill across that action group to put forward the best possible proposition. I've said before there are Scottish Enterprise grants that were there to help the plant transform uh, and it was doing that. If we come to the issue of, 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 of leverage around clawback, then of course that, that will be used. But right now the priority has to be focusing on continuing with a commercial manufacturing function at the Dundee site and ensuring that the company has an ongoing presence and we do everything we can to retain as many jobs as possible in view of the, uh, the, the position of the, the company not to revisit their original decision. So I'll leave no stone unturned, explore every avenue to put the best possible proposition to Michelin and I could be doing with support from UK government to get the best possible outcome for the people of Dundee. And Jenny Mara. I'd like to reiterate the support of the Labour benches to the work of the action group that the Cabinet Secretary has convened. Would the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that all parties at the group are committed to working together to get the best possible proposal and result for the Michelin workforce and for Dundee? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, uh, yes, they are. All, all attendees at the Action Group and the other business and industry experts that will help feed into that are giving us the, the, the necessary intelligence and 
and, and assistance to put forward the best possible proposition. It's that sense of solidarity and unity uh, where the workforce are key as well, the local authority uh, members and others. So I appreciate the cross-party support that we've enjoyed so far uh, to take forward that work and that will keep us energised as we get to that opportunity to present the case to Michelin. Question number five, Tom Meeson. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government when recommendations will, will be published for the location of three national neonatal intensive care units, as outlined in 2017, the Best Start Report's five-year plan. Cabinet Secretary Jean Freeman. The perinatal subgroup of the Best Start Implementation Programme Board is currently undertaking an options appraisal to identify the locations of the neonatal intensive care units. This work will move into a testing phase shortly, after which recommendations on those locations will be made to me. Tom Mason. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. In three written, recent written questions, I asked the Cabinet Secretary whether she thought it was acceptable for prematurely born babies to travel between the North East and the Central Belt for emergency neonatal intensive care treatment. She did not answer, instead citing potential transport links between the two. Let us be clear, we are talking about life-saving treatment for the most vulnerable, vulnerable babies. Will she not accept that any attempt to remove this lifeline service from the north of Scotland would be ill-advised and it would be simply dangerous? Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As Mr Mason will recall in the answer to those questions, I also made it absolutely clear that no neonatal units will close as a result of the Best Start recommendations for neonatal intensive care, and the Best Start does not recommend a reduction in the number of neonatal care centres in NHS Grampian or indeed anywhere else. Uh, the point I, I am making is that the testing for intensive uh, neonatal care uh, is in the option appraisal stage at this point. It will then move to a testing stage and those recommendations will come to me at that point. At that point, I will make uh, what I consider to be reasoned de decisions uh, based on those recommendations and that testing. But let me repeat, no neonatal units will close as a result of the Best Start recommendations, recommendations that came from a group of uh, highly experienced practitioners, the Royal College of Midwives, the Royal College of Nursing, obstetricians, consultant anaesthetists, and many others. And I will work with their clinical judgment about the best maternity care and configuration for women and babies in Scotland and not Mr Mason's. Question number six, Anasawa. To ask the Scottish Government what funding it provides to arts and culture facilities in Glasgow. Cabinet Secretary Fiona Hislop. Uh, the Scottish Government continues to provide extensive support to the arts in Glasgow. Four out of the five national performing companies are based in Glasgow, receiving over £20 million of grant a year. We have also invested extensively in Glasgow's cultural infrastructure, including £6.25 million towards the Kelvin Hall refurbishment, enabling the National Library of Scotland to have a core presence in Glasgow for the first time in a joint project with Glasgow Museums and the Hinterian. We are currently investing £5 million in the Borough Renaissance Project and £6 million in the Citizens Theatre Redevelopment. All of this current investment is on top of the Festival 2018 Cultural Programme in Glasgow as part of the highly successful European Championships, of course supported with £63 million of Scottish Government funding. And I, I, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. She will be aware that there is no central funding for the day-to-day -day running of the national facilities in Glasgow and that compares to uh, the tens of million that goes to facilities in Edinburgh. At the same time, there has been a 20% cut uh, in Glasgow's budget. Will she review the funding of our arts and cultural facilities in Glasgow to look at running costs? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I think the, the member is mistaken. If you listen to my answer, the national facilities that are in Glasgow are four out of the five national performing companies, and they receive over £20 million of grant a year. Glasgow is well funded. And of course, I didn't mention the £27.5 million of funding from Creative Scotland for regular funded organisations, the £8.5 million grant for the RSNO at the Glasgow Royal Concert Hall, or the £5.45 million of grant for Scottish Opera as part of Glasgow. Glasgow Theatre Royal. I think Glasgow is doing extremely well from support for arts and funding from the Scottish Government. Yeah, yeah. Kenneth Gibson. 
Thank you, President Officer. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware that the Arts in North Ayrshire received only £192,000 in grants last year compared to the £20 million she mentioned for Glasgow. So per capita, Glasgow receives almost 25 times as much as North Ayrshire. What steps will the Scottish Government work in conjunction with Creative Scotland take to build capacity in North Ayrshire and help close that gap? Cabinet Secretary. Well, one of the, the things that we are supporting is obviously the Creative Scotland's place partnerships. Uh, uh, North Ayrshire is part of that. Uh, we've protected in the last year Creative Scotland's budget. Indeed, we've increased it by £6.6 yeah. .6 million pounds to make sure we uh, make uh, uh, rectify the shortfall from the UK national lottery funding. Of course, more can be done to make sure the reach and range of cultural funding reach, uh, reaches communities across North Ayrshire and other areas. And I'm happy to supply the member with more information about that. Thank you very much, uh, Cabinet Secretary. And that concludes general questions.